the Abyss was the most physically taxing film I've made because we were underwater so much. I think Avatar was certainly the longest and the most complex film that I've ever made. More complex than Titanic or the Terminator films or, or anything else. On those films, especially the Terminator films, we broke new ground with the CG effects and so on. And we were always trying to push the envelope. This time, it pushed back. And then we pushed harder. And it took a long time. And there was no book to look this up. There was no manual for how you do this sort of film. And we were doing it very differently than previous performance capture films because we went beyond. It's by definition, as exploring a frontier, you're going to make mistakes. We made mistakes, but we figured it out. I'm only smart enough to surround myself with enough smart people to solve the problems. And I had a great team because we were way out in the unknown. But that's cool. That's People have asked me, what was your inspiration? What was the trigger? They're looking for some kind of proximal cause. And there really isn't one, OK? It's my whole life. It's my entire childhood. I grew up in a town in rural Canada. I spent all my time in the woods. I loved critters, you know? I would catch anything that moved and study it, keep it as a pet, snakes, frogs, amphibians, whatever it was I could get my hands on. So I grew up with this kind of profound sense of wonder about nature. And I was also a science fiction and fantasy fan from the earliest time I can remember. And I was an artist. So my way of processing that was to draw and to paint. And I was painting creatures and painting alien worlds for as far back as I can remember. So my avatar is really the sum total of all that. There was no single moment of inspiration. Now, the thing that got me off my duff to actually sit down and write it, this movie that I'd had in my head for most of my life in some form or other, was that I was the CEO of a big visual effects company. And I wanted to challenge that visual effects company to go beyond, not just beyond what everybody else was doing, but beyond the beyond. I wanted to be so far out in front that nobody would ever catch us. And that's essentially what Avatar is. It's the most high-tech film in terms of its execution, dealing with essentially a very low-tech subject, which is our relationship with nature. And in fact, the irony is that the film is about our relationship with nature and how our technological civilization has taken us several removes away from a truly natural existence, and the consequences of that to us. I first heard of Avatar when we were prepping Titanic. So it was 1995-ish. And Jim gave me a scriptment to read. And think of the scriptment as a novella with certain scenes broken out into dialogue. Come on! Come on! The essence of what I got out of reading the scriptment was that it was an emotional journey set in a world beyond what I certainly could have imagined. I figured if we could do that, we could do anything. And of course, the answer that I got was, we can't do this. Nobody can do this. And that was in 95. It was several years after that that we started to even think about it. And we did some tests on Brother Termite, which was a movie that involved an alien character in Washington, DC. And we needed this character to interact with humans. And we said to ourselves, we need to do that with performance capture. And we actually tested a whole sequence. Marion. Some of my people have disappeared. I need to know why. And Jim envisioned doing the facial performance with an image-based process. That was the seed that really proved to us that there was the potential to finally be able to do a film like Avatar. Avatar was written in 95 to be the next film after Titanic. And there was supposed to have been a continuity of work during the time that Titanic was being made to prepare us for making Avatar after Titanic. But we made a decision that it wasn't even worth putting together the, the couple of million dollars that we wanted to spend in research and development during that time because we wouldn't be able to get there in that time period. So I went off and made Titanic. And then after Titanic, I got very focused on deep ocean exploration. And I did six subsequent expeditions. And my last expedition ended in summer of 2005. And that's when we started Avatar. So we proposed to Fox that they support us for a year. And we would do several things during that year. First, we would research the technology. Could we really do the things we think we can do? And we would begin to develop the art of the world so that they could get a visual sense of where this movie would take place. We were doing two things simultaneously, and they involved two completely separate groups of people. 
One was the technical side, led by Rob Legato and Glenn Derry, and the other was on the design side, where we brought in a handful of artists that included Neville Page, Yuri Bartoli, George Rochelle, Wayne Barlow, and a gentleman by the name of Rob Powers. They went out to Malibu, where we set up in a facility so it could be near Jim, working on the designs for the film. We got the best artists we could find that had excellent portfolios, beautiful work in the fantasy and science fiction area, brought them together, formed a small core team. They wouldn't even tell me what the project was. I had no idea. We go in, we have this meeting with Jim, and we get the scriptment, we read the scriptment, and we start seeing all these big design possibilities. It's a whole world. We're salivating, because this is the chance to really come up with some new stuff, you know, something really unique. It was gonna be this really colorful jungle world, you know, of Pandora, very alien. That was one of the big issues at the beginning, was how alien do we get? Mostly the, the process is you start out with the big broad strokes. So we would do tons of drawings, just sketch away until Jim sees something that feels like it's getting close. All the time you're trying to predict or get into his head and see what it is that he sees. The Banshee is a great example of a creature that took a long time to create. It took almost two years to get the finished Banshees. What I kept coming back to them with, my question that I always pose to them is, what's the metaphor? What are we trying to say to the audience? What are we communicating with every bone and sinew that we put into this creature? And the answer to the metaphor question with the Banshee is, I want it to be a bird of prey. I want it to be like an eagle, but an alien eagle. You could apply that to all the different creatures. The metaphor for the Thanator, well, it's the biggest, baddest, meanest terrestrial predator in the entire Pandoran rainforest. And it actually landed pretty close to the initial description from 10 years earlier, which was that it was a black armored six-legged panther from hell. A constant is that they're all hexapetal to some degree, meaning they've all got six legs or six limbs. How do you make that work? Unfortunately, a real horse doesn't work with six legs, so you have to re-engineer an actual horse's anatomy, and that's kind of what we did. So even the flying creatures, there's a vestigial element of that in it. We looked at the colors of poison dart frogs and tropical reef fish. This is one of the things that I think is gonna separate all the creatures from a lot of creatures done in the past. These creatures are extremely colorful, very bright, very flamboyant. When you look at them, it's like, wow, that's, it's like a big kimono coming at you. The Navi took a long time to design, but the blue color was never in question because I felt that it was a fundamentally alien skin color that could be quite beautiful. But the idea that they incorporated animal-like features, cat's ears and cat tails and a slightly more protrusive muzzle and a kind of a flatter, more feline nose, big eyes, lemur-like eyes. This was all something that we arrived at over the course of designing these characters. We initially started out with kind of more amphibian-like and reptilian kind of forms and alien structures, you know, kind of antennae and things like that. And we kept realizing that it wouldn't work as a love story to see them not be attractive, but they couldn't be human. And then they kept coming back to just blue-skinned humans. We said, well, that's no good either. So we have to find ways of pushing away from human, but in a way that people would not find off-putting, and in fact, might even find to be kind of quite beautiful. I wanted people to say, I want to be one of them. Our art department started out working in flat artwork. We had nothing that we could hold up that was tactile in front of us. And we realized we had one of the great sculptors in our business on the show. And we tasked him with starting to sculpt out and build the characters. One of the most important things about the maquette is not that you're just showing the design. What the maquette allows us to do, it gives it the human touch. And it also imbues the character with a sense of character that cannot be stressed enough. You get a sense of attitude. The amount of character that you can get in clay as far as I see right now, is still superior to what you can get in just a digital, rotatable model. It's interesting. Stan Winston Studios did something on this movie that Stan Winston had not allowed them to do on any other movie in the past. They initially worked only as concept artists. The Navis don't all look alike. They all look like Navis, but they all have very implicit and very distinctive characters, and that's, of course, what we're most proud of, is you look at these characters and they are very, very rich and specific and quite mind-blowing. When Jim first came to us, he was looking to help flesh out the Navi character. 
he already knew some of the parameters. They were gonna have markings and he knew the basic overall size. So that's what we started doing, was creating Navi's trying to get a photo real kind of essence of these people. What happened in April of 2005, Rob Legato came to us and showed us some tests that he had actually done where he used a virtual camera, but in a post-production method. And he had the idea that he could apply that same thing to performance capture. How it started was essentially coming up with an emulation of how we like to make live action movies. Normally, you go into a film and you at least have a basic idea. There's a process that's been in place for, you know, 100 years towards creating these images. But Jim wanted to do it different. And I remember the day that Jim and John visited the Beowulf set, which basically was a blind cap paradigm, which means reference cameras only for the performances of your actors and not seeing any rendered caricatures or environments at all. And I saw this little glint in Jim's eye, and I knew he was up to something, but he didn't tell any of us. He didn't tell me. That's basically the genesis or the idea where he says, I think we can do a tool for the director, enabling him to come up with real-time performance capture. So we had to come up with a way that was sort of director-centric and gave him the tool set that he needed to be able to work with. I went to Jim, and I said, I can make this thing that you would like. So essentially, out of spare parts, made a virtual camera. So we put you in a spatial volume. The volume is the stage, and the stage is really what we can capture, what our cameras are seeing. You've got a bunch of markers on the actor's body that are being picked up by hundreds of cameras. So the hundreds of cameras are providing different views of these markers. Each camera's image just looks like a cloud of dots. And then the computer is creating a real-time moving skeleton of you. From that skeleton, you now can drive a computer-generated character and that image is then pumped out to me at the camera. When somebody is standing in front of the camera, I don't see them, I see their character. So I'm basically walking around with a monitor. There's no lens on this thing. It's just a markered object that the system recognizes as a camera and pointing it at things. And it's showing you what that would look like through a real-time computer render. So we call it a camera, but it's not truly a camera. Good. Save that, please. It wasn't until we brought in Rick Carter and Rob Stromberg that the world of Pandora really came to life. Actually, I was only supposed to be on this film for two weeks. I came on because Jim needed help with a presentation to the studio. I did a couple of images and Jim saw those and said, you know what, you're staying. We are very lucky to have gotten Rick Carter to come on to our film. And he came in and he saw the movie on so many different levels. I think that what's unique and special about Avatar is that it's an experience. The part of the job that matters to me is, what's it about? The big questions of why, not just how are you gonna do it, which of course you have to do, but you have to come up with the whys because those are what motivate you to actually inspire this army of people. And he was able to bring into the fold Ryan Church and James Klein and others who just elevated everything. And he worked collaboratively with Rob Stromberg and Rob and Rick shared the responsibility ultimately of designing the world. This is a real alien planet. The degree to which Jim has thought through the ecosystems and the interactions, this is the first time I've seen anything like this. When you first get there, it's actually a very scary place. We wanted to play out the haunted house factor, the sort of, you know, you don't want to go in there. But then over time, as the characters develop, so does the environment. It develops into beauty, and you get to respect it, much as the people who live there respect it. It's a very primeval landscape. Huge, craggly mountains, exciting ring structures from magnetic fields and stuff like that, and then, of course, the giant floating mountains. So it's very science fiction, but yet we're trying to take those very science fiction things, but kind of ground that in sort of a reality. For inspiration, we looked a lot at various regions of China, such as the Guilin area and the Zhengjiajie area, because they have these limestone formations called karst formations. And we also reference a lot of South American jungle, a lot of Venezuela, areas around Tepui and uh, Angel Falls. For like the smaller things, such as the alien plants, we would reference a lot of small lichen, small succulents that actually exist on Earth, exotic flowers, and just really play up the scale of those. Jim was really adamant about wanting Pandora to be possible. So his vision was to really have as much real and good science in it 
as it could be. On Pandora, or anywhere, the environmental factors that would have the most influence on plants would be the light, the solar radiation, which is needed for photosynthesis. So on Pandora, there's a very strong magnetic field and very weak gravity, so plants were able to grow much larger. So gigantism, the large trees, the large plants. That is one big damn tree. By starting out with the designs and the daytime stuff, it was after that that we got into the bioluminescence. The idea that there is fairly low light could conceivably cause plants to evolve bioluminescence. We wanted it to have this kind of dreamlike quality. But the eye needed to be educated through the experience of the film. First, we're going to fly down through clouds. Then we're going to go to this human base. Then we're going to move off that base out into the forest. But we're going to go out there in the daytime. And then we're going to gradually take you into that more and more alien experience of Pandora. And that was by design. We knew we were doing that, because we knew that ultimately we were going to wind up in a fully CG rainforest with fully CG characters, and it had to look real. As it's getting dark for the first time in the jungle, Jake lights a torch, and we play the whole scene sort of torch lit, so you don't give away the bioluminescence. And there's a moment in the film where Natiri takes the torch and throws it in a river. It's almost like opening the door to Oz. The torch goes out and you see the bioluminescence for the first time. There we go. One of the first things we did when we had the system up and running is we shot what we called a prototype. Maybe we were crazy, but we never doubted that it would work. So we cast two actors who were not going to be the final actors, and we shot a short scene. OK, I, I'm sorry. Whatever I did, I'm sorry. And the ILM finished it for us through to a so-called photoreal level. You only come and make You not fear, you strong heart. But stupid, ignorant like child. From that moment, when we saw that little 37 second clip, we knew this would work. It was just a question of how easy it was gonna be. Of course, it wasn't easy. How much it was gonna cost and how long it was gonna take. But we never doubted that it could be done. Weta Digital started with us doing the R&D on the project and was very eager to do the film. John came to New Zealand to talk to us and brought a copy of Jim's original treatment for Avatar. I read it and I just devoured it. It was fantastic. And so we just started talking about it and just, just talking about the ideas that were in the story, the characters, the jungle, the floating mountains, the plants, just the whole world. It just seemed too fantastic to not put it on screen. They just come off of Lord of the Rings. They were finishing up King Kong. And they had two firm offers to take very big shows. And they went to the board of directors at Weta, and they made a decision to pass on those money-paying shows and wait for Avatar in the hope that we would get green lit. Are we going to have somebody from your team with us next week while we're doing the scene? Yeah, I'll be there next week. Joe's going to be there, and we'll complain about that. <laughs> we worked with two different sides of Weta. We worked with Weta Digital, led by Joe Letteri, that was going to do the visual effects on the movie. And we began working with Richard Taylor and his incredible team of artists at Weta Workshop. One of our trademarks at Weta is that we love to design a historical culture, a believable lineage of culture within a world. I felt that this offered us that opportunity. I would suggest the Navi culture is, a, is more aligned to a Pacific culture. And what we've done is we've gone and hired weavers that come from the Pacific and they're able to put that level of culture in. Regardless of the fact it was set in the future, the people of this world needed to feel that they had lived in the past, they'd been on a journey to this place, and I found that really exciting. We had a discussion, you know, what kind of culture are they? Well, they're Neolithic culture, they can't use metals because they're in these very powerful magnetic fields. So they have to make everything out of bone and crystal and leather and so on. Also woven into it, Jim definitely saw a further layer of adornment that would be suggestive of a culture that existed beyond the moment in the movie. What Jim wanted to portray in the Navi people is actually a tribal 
look that was unique, soft, and beautiful, organic, reflecting the kind of philosophy that the Navi people live, which is very utopic and happy. How's that? I'm so worried. Still breathing? No. Yeah. We'll, we'll have to be careful if you start to turn blue. Yeah. <laughs> I think one of the biggest disservices on this movie, sort of during the award season, if you will, was that the costume design was not recognized. There were actually two costume designers, but when Deb Scott came in, she actually fabricated every single article of clothing that every single virtual character in the movie wore. It's a little bit of a learning experience for everyone to really try to figure out what the place of the costume designer might be. I didn't understand anything to do with computers, really, or how that process was when I started. So I was completely playing catch up. I was stitching and sewing with a lot of amazing craftspeople who had been working on the project. They were approaching it just like the Navi would. Like, how would you weave a chess plate? So it was really like a giant jigsaw puzzle, taking some pieces that other people had already built, adding on to new pieces that I had craftspeople who had already been working on the project built for me and sort of taking on and trying to finish off each character, which ended up being quite a few pieces. The other challenge, of course, is that it can't look like anything you'd ever find on Earth. And that's fantastic. That's just such a cool challenge. Just start from scratch. What does a knife look like, you know? How do you wear it? All of the stuff informs everything else. It's impossible for a CG artists to imagine how to simulate this stuff if there's no real world reference first. Moat's ceremonial gown, what we called her mantle, we had to make that. And it was actually made in a number of different fabrics until we got exactly the right weight that would move the way we wanted it to move. No, I think. The same thing with Sute's battle fringe. <laughs> Deb Scott made up all kinds of different fringe of different weights and different lengths and so on. And we tested it. Basically, we did wind tunnel testing and saw what it looked like and imaged it. And then we said, all right, that's the weight. That's the right fringe. That's exactly the right color and length. Now, Weta, you guys have to figure out how to do a simulation and incorporate it into the animation. All right, here we go. And action. Two of the biggest challenges of keeping people engaged in the movie while we were going through this process were our two stars, Sam Worthington and Zoe Saldana. We spent months and months and months looking at people, and then all of a sudden, Sam came on. And I, I, I mean, I remember the moment. So when I first came here, it was just orders. And then something happened. I, I fell in love with um, the forest and the people and with you. And the thing for me about Jake was, in the end, I had to believe that the people would follow him. Well, we will send them a message that this is our land. I sold everything I owned. All I had was basically a bag of books and a bag of clothes and my $3,000 car, and then I get a phone call to do this audition where they wouldn't tell me anything about the script, wouldn't tell me who the director was. And I'm thinking, well, once again, it's another waste of my time. And then um, about a week later, I get a phone call going, look, Jim Cameron wants to fly you to LA to audition for him. I said, what the hell for? And they said, that, that audition you did. And I went, oh, here we go. And I said, well, I've got to get down off, I was snowboarding at the time. I said, I've got to get down off the mountain first, it could be dead. So, uh, especially the way I snowboard. All right, got that? All right, here we go. And because I was coming from having nothing to lose, it actually powered me up to actually kind of not be scared. So when you go into the audition and there's the guy who did Aliens and Titanic, and you go, what do you got, mate? Let's go. I think that's the character right there. I wanted him to be young, because I wanted him to be a guy who the promise of his life had been taken away by his injury. And Sam was exactly 30 when I met him, I think maybe even 29. But Sam had all the qualities that I was looking for to play Jake. But he talked like this. <laughs> <laughs> he was like Crocodile Dundee. <laughs> we had to work on the accent a little bit. I ain't gonna show you that I'm weak to it, no, unless you want me to. Exactly. But he did, as Sam does with all things. He conquered the accent, he conquered the physicality, and we slapped an experimental head rig on his head and said, now, be the star of this movie. He didn't blink, you know? He just did it. A clean kill. You ready? So we had a combination of delicacy and boldness. There was a fierceness about her and an incredible physicality that was essential. 
to being able to do this. It was unusual, the auditioning process. From Margie to John, and after finally meeting Jim, I was that close. But at the same time, I was that far from getting the part. It was just a fun experience. It's your fault. All your fault didn't have to die. They attacked me. How, how am I the bad guy? Your fault. You're like a child making noise, not knowing what to do. The way they painted it out is like, we were just going to have fun, experiment, and see where it might take us. And once they kept it that light, I was able to not feel the pressure of wanting to get this job. Why is it? Yeah, why is it? He has strong arm. We decided to do a little informal screen test between Sam Worthington and Zoe Saldana, our two leading choices for the roles. Because the key to this was performance and chemistry. Jake and Neytiri, that relationship had to work with the movie. Wasn't going to work. I've chosen. No woman has to choose me. Out of that, again, Jim felt very comfortable in his decisions. But we didn't have a green light on the movie. The studio was also thinking, gee, you really need a star in this movie, you know, for the Sam Worthington character. You know, their eyes get a little bit too big for what they're really ready to embrace. It was a six months process of waiting. You know, I said to Jim, I'll stand by the whole way. I, you know, I want to be, I want to go on this journey and, and I need a damn job. So we did an old fashioned Hollywood screen test with a slightly new twist that it was in 3D. We will send them a message that they cannot take whatever they want and that this, this is our land. It was after watching those scenes that Fox came on board and realized that Sam was the right one for that part. And in January of 2007, we got the green light. And that was both a very exciting day and a very daunting day. Because all of a sudden, we really had to make the film. Outstanding. I wanted to have my main character become the stranger in the strange land, become the alien, see the world through alien eyes, but still with a human perspective. So he was a human in an alien body trying to integrate into an alien society. And I wanted that idea of trying to learn the other culture. And of course, the first key to that is always language. What's he saying? I had done some of that stuff before I ever met with a linguist. I was just basing it on my sort of casual acquaintance with some Polynesian languages, some other languages that had these kind of various, you know, symbols and indicators for pronunciation. So then when I started working with Dr. Paul Frommer, he got excited by that. He said, what does this apostrophe mean to you? I said, well, it's just the way you pronounce that word. He said, okay, let's work with that and we'll incorporate that into it. And then he went miles and miles beyond those initial ideas. He wanted something that didn't sound like anything that we've ever heard before, but also that sounded like something that was doable in the sense that the actors could master it. He showed me some of the words that he had come up with, and that gave me a sense of the kind of sounds he had in mind. And so at that point, I kind of built from there. It's All the lines that were to be spoken in Navi first appeared in English, and then it was up to me to turn that into Navi. Once I had the elements of the language in place, it was pretty much a translation exercise. Except that I didn't have a dictionary. I was one who created the dictionary. So, of course, I had to create the words as well as put them together into sentences. When I started the job, I asked if I could meet with Paul, who was writing the language. And he was still in the process of writing it at that point. So every actor that came in, whether they were coming in for Human into an Avatar or a, or a Navi role, all the auditions have them sitting there doing and, and you know, all this sort of stuff. Ah. Uh. Oh, basically what they did was, you walk in there, casting director says, okay, you're gonna do the audition, but you're not gonna do it in English. No more son de l'école! I know a lot of people that got pissed and they walked out of there angry. And I just remember, like, I was speaking gibberish and I walked out and I was like, nobody's gonna like that, it's, it was awful. I was embarrassed. Nah. Ni, no, mu. They responded to it, and more than anything, my performance 
came through. Hey, Didi. Why did you tell me to kill us? Like a month and a half later, I get a call, and they're like, Jim wants to meet you. I'm like, over that? You're Jake, right? Tom's brother. Wow. You look just like him. Sigourney and I had been through an experience early in both our careers that was a huge break for both of us. She got an Academy Award nomination for playing a character in a science fiction movie, which was almost unprecedented. Get away from her, you bitch! <sighs> but that was, you know, 23 years earlier. In a funny way, I'd almost discounted working with Sigourney because we had done Aliens and because it was a science fiction film about an encounter with an alien species. I thought, mm, that, 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 that might be a little too close to, to home. But then I thought, you know, idiot. She's perfect for this character. She can do an amazing job with Grace Augustine, and Grace Augustine is not Ripley. I'm changing her name. Oh, OK. Because I don't want to do Ripley and Shipley. All righty. <laughs> <laughs> let's say it's going to be Grace Augustine. Frankly, it's thrilling to be working with Jim again since we did Aliens, but also to be in the first movie he's wanted to do since Titanic and to see how excited he is about the writing, the shooting, the this, the that, you know, the joy he has of working on this finally. He's quite unique, I think, really unique. And I just felt that there was an interesting spin on her being involved in a story in which we are the aliens, you know? The word alien is used in the film. It's used by the Navi speaking of us. Get the pale for hell, <laughs> So there's an interesting irony there. It's such a great adventure, and it's also at the same time a great love story. Also very much about big business and their blindness to the destruction they cause. Murderer! As we got the actors, it kind of fell into place that we would incorporate the actor into the design and kind of came up with an idea that it would be great to try to retain the mouth and some of the facial characteristics of that actor so that that actor's performance would come through. And to develop Zoe, who plays Natiri, we actually went to set and put her through a whole battery of photographs. And then on top of the actress's photograph, then we would turn her into a Navi. So we did complete turnarounds, all different angles of the head and neck. And this is the photograph that I used to start this image here. We took this through at least 50, 60 versions. For each actor, we put them through a life cast process, which we used for our designing purposes when it came to a 3D sculpture. Look at that. It's, it, it, it's absolutely fantastic. What an incredible cast, I must say. New eyebrows in there? Oh, your eyebrows are right there. They're still on your head. They're all on your head. <laughs> which in turn get scanned into computer files, which are sent to Weta, and then they will then work off of this design that we've done and help bring those to life. It was very important for us to put all of our actors through a training regimen that was specific to their characters. Everything they say, everything they do, every physical part of their performance is all done by actors. It's captured performance. And this applies to Sam Worthington's character and all the other characters as well that are Navi or avatars. How they move, how they breathe, how they stand, everything had to be created by them. So Sam, we had him learn Navi. Navi, get the SUV. We had him work out with a trainer. Sam had to do military training, and he worked with my brother. He's a former Marine. He fought in Desert Storm. So we got you know some of his Marine Corps buddies, and they took him out, put him through his paces. And that gave him a little bit of the mindset to draw from to play his character. Nothing that I'm giving you, Sam, is outside of Sam the combat mode for Jonah. They want you to kind of be proficient with weaponry and stuff like that, because the guy's a Marine. So I wanted to actually meet other Marines. On round four times. Go, go, go. To me, it was more the way these guys see the world and the way that their training has made them think. And nothing can stop them. And it's drilled into them to achieve their mission. You've got the man next to you, and if he goes down, you pick him up, and you keep going. Keep going. You got it, Sam. Let's go. Keep going. Keep going. Another max. Waiting on you. Let's go. You know, that gave me a base to jump from. So that was the best training I had. Welcome to our world. Hey, fuck it. Jesus Christ. I should just drop here. Okay. Okay. 
Zoe went through a tremendous amount of training as did Laz and CCH. She went through horseback training, archery training, movement training, dance training, language training. Made To say we did a lot of training is, is, is an understatement. We actually had to learn how to walk like a Navi. We had to learn how to do everything from our core. They only exhibit speed or power when they absolutely have to until they explode. And when they explode, I mean, they move like the wind. They worked with the movement coach, Terry Notary, and Terry came up with certain ways of moving that involved the way the, the chest and the spine would move to create some kind of animal grace, some power in the step. We work with each actor as a whole and then separate them and work with them as individuals so that they can first create a base technique. So there's some inspiration coming from different sources. It's not an ape or it's not a cheetah. It's a combination of a bunch of things that the character is inspired by. Without Terry Notary, we would have a species that would talk a different language, but would walk human and react as humans do. Terry worked with the complete cast to create a unity of movement and create a believability in this culture that they had grown up together. There's a connection between the people in their environment. This is part of how they get their strength. This is part of how they survive. This is part of them getting energy. We play around with all of that. There were some big dance numbers that got cut out of the movie, but her choreography, her movement that she created is still very much a part of the film. When you see all the ceremonial stuff where they're swaying and rocking around and throwing their arms in the air in, the, in these very precise time signatures, all of that was created by Lula and by her troupe. I got a hold of uh, Zoe and we taught her how to run, how to jump on a wire, how to shoot her bow. That was one of the biggest things we had to work with for her, is how to shoot this bow and arrow more different than ever has been done before. Zoe was the first person we started to teach the bow work to it. Zoe's a lefty. So once we established that they were lefties, we said all of them are be lefties. Jim came up with the idea of, this is such a human gesture. Let's just do this. And all of a sudden, it's no longer human feeling. And it also accentuates the idea that the Navis only have three digits. It wouldn't work very well for a human, but the Navi are subtly different in terms of their, their biomechanics. And you can see that in their upper body musculature and so on, especially in the males. The archery teacher came to me puzzled. He says, all right, you're showing the actors one way of doing it, but you're having me teach them proper archery. And I said, well, I want them to respect the power of the bow, and I want them to understand the, the focus, the breathing, and all those things that you can teach them. That strength has to project from the core of your body through the bow arm towards the target. And if nothing else, you think of your target as boom. Think of your target as boom. We had two instructors from the Olympic team come to help work with our actors. And we showed them this idea of doing it backwards. And at first, they were very skeptical. And he said, you know, you can't shoot a bow that way. And I said, really? You can't? Come with me. So I got a bow from the prop man, and I got an arrow, and I walked out behind the studio, and I said, you see that bush over there that's, a, that's about 75 meters away? He said, yes. And I went like that and hit it. And he said, oh, you can shoot a bow that way. <laughs> because I'd been out there practicing and I got lucky with that one shot but I but I hit it let's go through the first page of background dialogue part one what we've done is we've really worked on it as a company of actors and what we've been doing in the last couple of weeks is having them speak their way of speaking Navi to each other but what we've just been doing is to have Zoe and Lance come up and just do a little bit of the dialogue so that Wes can hear what we've established so that it. rhythmically and so on he can kind of match up and he's doing great. So that we're artificially creating that melting pot. It's part of your costume, it's part of who you become. So you want it to become natural and fluid. Well, I'm lucky because the character only just learns it over the course of the movie. So if I slip up, it, it helps the character. Nari. 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 
Paul Frommer had created a language. He wasn't creating an accent. So I basically said, Zoe, you get to establish what Navi sounds like and what the Navi accent sounds like, because you're the one with the most lines. And then everybody else is just going to have to try to match you as best they can. It's very hard, because how do I speak English with an accent? I barely speak English all on itself. The one who interprets the will of Ava. To me, it's been the most challenging thing, is to speak English with a Navi accent. I need your help. You should not be here. I knew that we were going to be working in this sterile gray space, this volume. And I didn't want the actors to just sort of come in on the first Monday morning of the shoot and not have any kind of basis for feeling like they were in a rainforest. So we went to Kauai, we went way up in the mountains, and we acted out the scenes. Relax, Maureen. You're making me nervous. And we just did behaviors, but trying to kind of stay in character and talking as if they're, they're characters. Sigourney fed on this a great deal. I know Sam and Zoe got a lot out of it. We didn't know what it was going to be like, and Jim took it further. I thought we were just going to be in our regular clothes, you know, hiking, just to get a physical taste of what it's going to be like to live in a planet and have to rely on anything comfortable. But it was that, but also wearing our costumes. So I was, I was naked <laughs> for three days in Hawaii, up in, like, the forest, just digging and climbing and muddy and we're videotaping and we're going through the inside of this jungle. Are you sleeping on my tail? <laughs> <laughs> and I saw this headless rat and I'm, you know, I'm with my bow and I'm in character. The moment I saw this rat, I was just like, immediately I went back to like my New York state of mind. I was like, oh my God, I can't deal with this. And he's like, suck it up. <laughs> Jim was like, come on, Nick Thierry, suck it up. I'm like, right. Right, okay, Zoe, leave. Uh, this is a uh, jungle, no TV, no Blackberry. Let me just do this. So it's, it's been a struggle every day to kind of, you know, undo everything that has been done up until my years. I just absorbed that place. I absorbed the beauty of the rainforest there. And we did a couple of scenes and we ran around in loincloths, you know, pretending we were the Navi and the Avatar. And there's a difference between being out in the real world and then coming into this you know, grey, desolate area and actually trying to have to, you know, remember what it was like in the water. So if you're swimming in here, if you're swimming on kind of just a rolling chair, your brain can kind of remember. We got to rehearse a, a few of the scenes and we got to rehearse with physical things because we knew that we were going to be going into a mocap stage and we weren't going to, you know, you don't know how your foot lands in mud if you're just standing on cement. So your body reacts differently to things once you've actually gone out and done those things. I was shooting them with an HD camera the entire time, just watching how they moved, how they behaved, how the light played on their faces, the light through the trees, if it was sunny, if it was rainy, if it was cloudy. And a lot of that fed my process, you know, on the visual side for how we would light these scenes later. So it was very, very instructive. But I think the biggest part of it that was valuable was just the kind of kinesthetic sense memory that allowed them to create. What did it smell like? What did it feel like? What did the trail feel like under your feet? Come on! So it was about making it real for the actors. And action. It took us from 2005 to 2007 to get the performance capture system up and running and proven to work in a way that neither diluted nor augmented the actor's performance. And so the actors were convinced going in that what they did on the day that they did a scene was definitive, that that's what their CG character would be seen doing later. Yeah. Told them, you're not doing a voice part. You're acting your character just as you would if there was a camera there. There just isn't a camera. So you have to think of it as CG makeup. Let's dance. I was on a quest for the Holy Grail, and the Holy Grail was to be able to reproduce full human emotion in a CG character. And of course, the thing we were afraid of is what people have sometimes called the dead eye effect, describing the strange disconnect that we have sometimes from CG characters. And I knew that Avatar would just fail utterly if we didn't crack this problem. And the idea that I had clung to for a long time was this idea of mounting a camera directly to the actor's head. So we started drawing this up, and Glenn Derry, his little ragtag team of engineers, started looking at how do we keep it light? So we wound up with a tight-fitting carbon fiber 
helmet that was molded to the actor's head. So we've got this very wide angle sort of data lens that's here on their face, but we have to be able to see the entire performance of the talent. So we would shoot reference cameras of the actors, and these are a critical step in the virtual production process. It's important to understand that the reference cameras and the virtual camera are two completely different things. The virtual camera shows us what the shot will look like with the CG characters and the world combined, because we can't see the fine nuances of the performance in the virtual camera. The reference cameras are absolutely critical for getting exactly the moment that we want. You got five takes, they're all gonna be good because they're good actors, but there's gonna be one take that's special or maybe special for a moment. We need to know that, that's what the reference cameras are for. And then the animators take the reference footage and they use it to make sure that they're not making a mistake. Let me know when you're ready, Dave. I'd like to introduce the performers into the volume, please. I had to take everything I learned in training and apply it to my first day. I had to ride a horse, jump off of him, appearing to be as graceful as possible, land, move like a Navi, and from that first moment when they set that horse and they let that thing go, instantly, Sute just jumped in my body and, and Laz went somewhere else. What's happening? You've got to swim pretty quickly otherwise you're going to drown in it. And Jim makes you comfortable. You dive in and you, it doesn't take you long to get rid of all the technical aspects. I need your help. You should not be here. It's liberating. It's just you and the other person. Yeah, they've got dots on their face and a helmet cam and power packs, but you can still see their eyes. And it takes acting back to what it should be, which is trying to get something from the other person and vice versa. I trusted you. Trust me now, please. Look out! What I can say is that every day I would go to work the same way I went to work for Star Trek or other movies that I've done before, and there was nothing different about what I was doing. Just the prep work, as opposed to going through hair and makeup, I went through dots, and then all of a sudden I was on the set, and I was playing a Terry. Jim says action. I don't know what happens. I at least have no idea that I'm wearing this. I feel like I'm blue and I'm nine feet tall, and I'm as sexy as hell. Like, I just totally forget. <laughs> Actors have said to me, you know, sort of half jokingly, but a little nervously, so are you trying to replace actors? And of course the answer is no, we love actors. This whole thing is about acting and it's about creating these fantasy characters through the process of acting. What we're replacing is five hours in the makeup chair, having rubber glued all over your face. So I think the actors found it very collaborative, empowering, freeing. I think it was just plain fun. It's kind of fun. There's been a lot of discussion about performance capture and what it means for actors and the impact it'll have. To me, it completely expands what we're capable of doing. And I think digital prosthetics is an interesting way of looking at it. Grace? Well, who'd you expect, numb nuts? Ultimately, I felt that it totally expanded what the actor could do. I feel like I could play any age character, any species, anything. I could play an alien now. I think it actually kind of gives us wings. And action. We use that sandbox, we use that spatial environment to do everything. It's where we created the sets. It's where we blocked the scenes. It's where we captured the actors. It's where we did all the stunt work. I mean, we had horses galloping around this place. We did everything in the volume. We came up with a number of methodologies for shooting some of these big aerial scenes. Start by, first of all, figuring out what the aerial choreography would be. So we thought, well, if we're going to talk about it, why don't we act it out in the volume? So we made little wire models of the various creatures and aircraft, put markers on them so the system would recognize them, and then we just go out there and fly them around. Basically chasing each other, like kids playing with two toys. This was a very, very instant way to do it. We could block it very quickly, understand whether or not the overall performance worked before we ever even gave it to an animator and said, now that has to be legitimized. The performance capture system would record the motion that Jim was getting. Those flight paths were then used to animate the Banshees against, the Samsons against, the Dragon against. The integration of animation was another headache, you know? In and of itself, it doesn't seem like a big deal, but we had to take it through phases and work out a pipeline. So what we would have is either a puppeteered version where myself and Jim doing flight paths, or we had a creature performers. Ah! Oh, shut up and fly straight! We really found that flying the Banshee was the hardest problem. So we created a manually operated gimbal rig that they could balance on and we'd ask the actors to perform to the timing and movement of the flight path. So if their banshee banked to the right, the rider had to do the opposite to maintain a center of gravity. Bang! Level. Flare. 
flap, 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 jump. And when you see them flying these things, they're working hard. And they used to be just in absolute agony the day after a flight scene. The biggest set pieces for the stunt department really have been this thing that we call the beanstalk. Jim wanted the actual beanstalk to be created. So these people actually had to climb it as if we were climbing it on a cliff. Climb up there and then get around to the left side. Come on, climb up and then climb right around to the left side right away. And so we put them on wires and we put two sandbags, which would take about 40 pounds off the person. They can climb it a little bit faster than they normally would. You need to build all of these physical cues for the actors and for Jim to work with so that the digital world starts to take on the character of the real world. Stop! We would have to build layouts, which were the physical interactive set pieces. So that if you saw the Navi climbing a mountain, we had to create, let's say, a 20 degree grade. If they were climbing a vine, we drop ropes down and you'd see them climbing a vine. So it was all very interactive. Yet there was no environment there. There was no jungle. And we can be very improvisational because we're not bound by the set. There's nothing on the set. It's a great set. But the difference is that a big boulder would take an hour and a half with a bulldozer and crew to move it. In our world, it literally takes a second. We select it and move it. And if he says it's too big, we scale it down. Everything in our environments is modular. Okay, bring the camera around. Any plant, any mountain, any exotic alien life form can be completely moved and configured and sized and scaled with a push of a button. The thing that's amazing about it is that we don't wait for lights. Things that you normally wait for on a film set have been switched over to computers and to digital this and digital that. If I want to whistle up a tree or a mountain or anything, I can do it very quickly. And there were often times when we'd come in to work a scene on a given day, and we'd get some ideas, and we'd run with that. He likes actors, which is really helpful, particularly for something like this, where you're not seeing the physical set. It's really important to have the kind of director who can lead you and let you know what's happening, and then you can react to that. Ah! Ah! His detail is spectacular, so he can create the picture for you that you're not seeing. We would create very rough animation in the virtual production stage for our creatures. It's a territorial threat display. Do not run or he'll charge. So what do I do, dance with it? Jim would be there with a pole and going after Sam, and he'd be representing the hammerhead. We did an animation pass on that just to figure out what we wanted this creature to be. Jim shot Sam doing Jake's reaction. What about this one? Run, don't run, what? Jim could play back that animation on stage as if the creature were there, because in his camera, he would see it. So it becomes just another performer. So if I have a good overlap, then I can play them and get them into their position. Yeah, of course. So he could direct Sam how to play off of that, because again, in the virtual world, it's all there for him. Run, definitely run! <laughs> We thought we learned everything in the first year of research and development, because we had done a test and based all of our reasoning on a scene with only two people in it. We hadn't done a scene with 10 people or 100 people in it, and those represented more difficulties in virtual production. If we got past five characters, it would create a problem just capturing the motion, never mind getting them to run with fully fledged sets and light. We just hit a ceiling, man. We taxed the hardware to the max and the software. At that point, it was untested. It was not built for what we were trying to do. So every time we pushed, it crashed. We've got no save. No save. Let's go again, please. Here's an example of a scene that almost broke the system. Made of a lot of different elements. You can see there are horses, different performances of the principles and the crowds that were on the side. They all combined together in one shot. And we're selecting specific actions and syncing them all up so that they all play relative to whatever is happening. This is like reinventing the wheel. It was really challenging, I have to say. I've never been so challenged on anything. So here we are two years into making Avatar, which is longer than it took us to do all of Titanic right through finishing the movie. And we're still six months away from starting 
an entire live action movie, and it had nothing to do with the virtual production. It was pretty daunting. One of the big challenges of designing this movie was that you have two completely separate worlds coming together with two completely separate modes of technology and two completely separate aesthetics. You've got the Navi who are a weaving culture and you've got the humans who work with technology, with metals and electronics and with composite carbon fibers, all of this sort of thing, advanced military weaponry. And we had basically different artists worked on these two different cultures. We brought in people like uh, Ty Ruben Ellingson, and Ben Proctor and Paul Osmo, who all worked on that type of material. Most directors are content to have something kind of look cool, and Jim, that's just not his world at all. When it comes to mechanics and man-made objects or bits of technology or, or, or bits of architecture, vehicles, all this sort of stuff, he wants it all to work. He wants it all to make sense. He wants to see an engineering mindset was put into it, a practical mindset. Why is this handle here? What is this piston doing? It's not about strict sort of art direction and, and cosmetics. It's, it's a, a more thoughtful design process, and he holds us all to that standard. All the way from Earth to Hell's Gate, it had to have a human scale to it. It had to have a human livability in it. Jim wanted this contrast of gray tones and kind of depressed look to everything. It looked livable. It looked like it had been there for a long time, or it looked like it had kind of gone through the ringer a bit. Of course, I love all that hardware stuff. I'm an unrequited engineer. I worked with Ty very closely to make sure that the amp suit's shoulder motion would work and was thought out in terms of the various articulations and where the servos would go. Range of motion was all thought through and where the power supplies would go, where the servos would go and all that. When you're approaching things, even inanimate objects, oftentimes you'll find if you listen carefully to what the director's saying or if you just think about it in terms of the story, they, they do have to have a narrative quality to them. For example, Scorpion, which is one of our small attack vehicles, it's called the Scorpion. You know, Jim came up with that name, of course, which is an angry, fighting little insect. And in the course of this film, this thing is a deadly force to reckon with. Scorpions pursue and destroy. So you want to build that into your design. You want this thing to look aggressive and arrogant and powerful, badass little killing scorpion. That's the shapes, that's the marks you make, and that's what you hope to get on screen. Once the creative part of designing the movie is done, you then settle down to the hard work of getting it all made, and we were able to ultimately tackle a lot of different items from the, the weaponry, the guns, but also the art department sending out many of their designs they'd already finished, such as the link units, the amnio tanks, for us to start building on. I'm the point person between the art department in LA, run by Rick Carter, and the physical art department of New Zealand. We spent about three months doing research and building little models and figuring out how to build the sets. Getting a construction plan and process based on what information, because this was fast-tracked and that they were still designing the sets in LA that we would be building in New Zealand. So we would take every little morsel, every scrap of information we got and run with it. In our original production plan, we were going to have a number of weeks where Jim was going to be able to get down to New Zealand and treat it like a normal show. And all of a sudden, because of the schedule changes and the need to edit, the need to turn over to Weta, that window that Jim was going to be in New Zealand before we started filming shrunk. He was only going to be down there for about six days. But we realized we had built a set of tools that could be helpful in this. And we took the virtual production and applied it to our live action sets. We'd location scout. Just like you'd get in your car and drive out to a location and scout it with a viewfinder, I'd walk into the volume and I'd scout it with the virtual camera. And Jim was able to rehearse in these virtual environments and made adjustments to the sets down in New Zealand without Jim ever going there. I'm wondering if we should just sort of slide this part of the set around. We've got roughly 25 sets worked out. We've got something like 40,000 square feet of floor area plus the rainforest, another 10,000 square feet, so they're quite big numbers. The crew of 140, you know, it's not a particularly big crew, but this is not the sort of show that you could just throw a lot of people at and say, here, finish that. It's just so technically demanding. This is really nice. Remember that sentry gun we had? Sure do. Here it is. You can go shoulder, or you can split it and go uh, two-hand. 
we built all of Hell's Gate that you saw in the interior, from the op center to the commissary where Quaritch makes his first speech to the jail cell that they break out of. We built the two shacks where they do the research, and we built the Samson itself. We had to build the link room and the links themselves. And these things had to work. From Jim on down, you feel like in every department, we're, we're working with people who exist at the pinnacle of their craft. And the attention to detail and the demand for excellence on all levels, I think, is just mind-boggling. It's almost like there are two different films being made, as there are sort of two different worlds. There's the world of the Navi and Pandora, and then there's the humans and stuff that's not necessarily CGI as much. And so it was kind of new for everybody. You know, we're in a Pilker wetsuit, and everything built so detailed that it kind of makes your job a lot easier than even being in the mocap world. It feels like a different movie because we've got a whole different cast, to be honest with you. You got Stephen Lang and Giovanni and uh, Dalit, and then you got Michelle as well. <laughs> Stephen Lang had respect for ideas of duty and courage and things like that, and he understood how he could channel that into a character that's basically a villain. But he's this very pure creature, and he came in for an audition and he knocked it out of the park. He's just riveting. It's my job to keep you alive. I will not succeed. Not with all of you. He said, do you remember when we met? And I said, I sure do. And we'd only met once before, and it's about 20 years ago. It was for Aliens. And he remembered the audition very well. And I find that kind of wonderful, that you can audition for something, and then 20 years later, you get the part. You know? I think it's great. There is time to salvage the situation. Park Shut diplomat. your pie hole. Or what, Ranger Rick? You going to shoot me? I can do that. live action side of it. We did more weaponry training, fight training. Quaritch carries this laser sighted pistol, and this comes into play occasionally. We work with Steven inside the amp suit and make it look like that he's been doing it for the last six, seven years. They didn't build this base for a guy in a wheelchair. They built it for able-bodied soldiers. You, know, you have to work out how to do it. We took him along to a uh, local basketball game in the wheelchairs playing basketball, which was um, which was pretty cool. Me and 10 of the stunt guys got some wheelchairs from the hospital and smashed them up a bit. And then you realize that your attention shouldn't be on the wheelchair. It should be on where you're going or what you're aiming for. Oh! 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 This right here is the Samson. Michelle, she wanted to learn to fly that helicopter, that rotorcraft in the movie as if it were real. So I gave her to a friend of mine who's a helicopter pilot to take her out and show her how to fly a helicopter. And she learned how to fly a helicopter. You're going to look like you know what you're doing, but you have to reach up and fire your guns whenever you're going to do. I got a couple of really exciting hours in LA flying a helicopter with Kevin, who actually taught James how to fly helicopters. There's something about being in the air that's just beautiful. Thank you for flying, Air Pandora. Sunny New Zealand. We never really felt like we had this first day, except when we went down to New Zealand, because that was a truly new break for us. I can just have everybody's attention for a second. This is kind of a pinch me moment that we're actually getting to make this movie. It's a dream project. You know, this script, the first draft of it was written 12 years ago. And we didn't start on the film then because, frankly, the visual effects guys told me I was mad to even try. We had high expectations coming into this that we were going to see something exceptional. And I would have to say that our expectations have been not only met, but exceeded by the workmanship, the dedication, the professionalism. And I just wanted to take this opportunity to thank everybody for what it's taken to get to this moment. Now, we obviously have hurdles ahead. There's no such thing as an easy shoot. I think, you know, when, when people rap on time, it's because they ran out of ideas. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, don't count on that. <laughs> Here we go. And action. The thing that's hardest to understand about all this is we actually created two completely separate camera systems that had completely different jobs. One was our virtual camera system to capture actors and shoot them virtually in a virtual environment. 
The other one was the fusion camera system, which was for shooting live action actors and sets in 3D. OK, that's a cut. I fell in love with 3D when I made my first 3D film, which was in 95. And that was T2 3D. The logistics and the technology required were enormous. The cameras were the size of refrigerators. This didn't seem to be practical. So the Fusion camera was an outgrowth of all the 3D camera development that Vince Pace and I had done for several years previously. It was designed to be a state-of-the-art professional cinema camera for 3D production. When we first looked at the camera system, we called it the reality camera system or the RCS because we were trying to mimic the human eyesight experience, so reality, if you will. Then Jim came with the name Fusion, which really is fusing creativity and technology. It's fusing the two images to form one, and that's really what we're doing. The design of the camera has been researched for a long period of time. What they've done is just take all the weight off a 3D system and essentially assemble two cameras with a beam splitter that are able to simultaneously photograph two images at the same time and you have a series of servos that basically you can align the two images or disline them according to how much 3D you're looking for in a shot. I've never done a film in 3D, so the experimentation was really enticing for me. And Technology for the 3D, it takes a little getting used to because it's like there's two cameras and they have to just check the I.O. every once in a while. And it's not that different, but just a little bit different, and you learn quickly, like, it's a technical marvel. Like, the fact that the cameras will photograph the same exact thing the same exact way, what your eyes do naturally. It took years and years to develop to make the cameras do it. Good. Once we're done shooting a scene, you can just walk 15 feet away, get yourself into a pod, put on some glasses, and watch your scene in 3D. A lot of our sets, we made the decision not to build full sets. We would put in green screens, and we would do set extensions. Roger that. If you take the link room, for example, we only built one side of that set. It was a mirror image on the other side, and we were able to fill that in digitally. Where we are right now is one end of the armor bay, and it goes, you know, about 50 feet. You realize that the armor bay is probably 10 times as long as we have it. It's absolutely filled with heavy weapons and amp suits. There's your man. See you on the flight line. Our probably biggest gag on this will be the emotion base we built for the Samson. It's huge, you know, it's the size of a bus. So. We also have the Samson in the back lot, which is going to be hung from a large crane. It's really cool. They basically land the thing. All the guys jump out just before it, like, hit the ground. I don't know how many feet in there. It was probably about 40. And they turn on these massive fans to make all of the foliage in the ground move. It's been the whole gamut of effects, really. Things breaking, simulated helicopter flight. Go, go, go! Bullet hits. Fire. Garrett sent me down his stunt breakdown, different gags that were related to those scenes. Door gunners are getting pulled out of Samson choppers by banshees. Also, some stuff that happens in the dragon. Multiple stunts and sequences where troopers are getting taken out. Probably the most technical movie I've been on. A challenge for everybody, but I think it's going to be a wicked product at the end. I have to say, these stunt guys, I mean, they really gave us their all. There's such a great spirit there in New Zealand. The energy they bring, the excitement. Live action shoot, as it turned out, was exhausting. It was a seven day a week process while we were down in New Zealand. So the shoot in New Zealand, which everybody thinks of as an exotic, easy location, was none of that. I uh, just want to say thank you very much for making this a, uh, a long and grueling shoot, but a wonderful shoot uh, in the sense that, that I, I really appreciate the, uh, the energy and the, the workmanship of the spirit, uh, no matter how long the hours got. Everybody's still pulled hard, and I think, I'm, uh, I think I'm on my way. As we were saying our goodbyes on the set, the stunt coordinator came up and said, the stunt team has something that they'd like to give you. It's going to hurt. Challenge. <laughs> <laughs> and I turned around, and here they all were, these New Zealand stunt guys. Some were Maori, some were not Maori, but they were all New Zealanders, and they had all 
worked on this haka. Apparently what this haka uh, does, if translated, is it challenges you to continue to do your best. And that was their way of thanking me. And they handed me the taiaha, which is the ceremonial staff. And that was their way of saying, New Zealand thanks you for bringing this project here and for making us a part of it. And it was a very, very emotional moment. Thank you. The whole time I was in the volume, I said, you know, if I was shooting this, it'd be so easy. You guys just spent five minutes trying to move one light 20 degrees around the subject. And if I was there, I could reach over and move it myself. It would take 20 seconds. Then I got to live action shooting. And, you know, moving big objects around in the background. And I said, you know, if this was CG, I could have moved that in 30 seconds. So the whole time I was shooting the virtual camera, I was complaining that it wasn't live action. The whole time I was doing the live action, I was complaining that it wasn't CG. By the time I got back to doing virtual production again, after the live action, I just kept my mouth shut. And action. Action. What I realized is that they're both hard and they're completely different. So you have to have a good team that knows one discipline and a good team that knows the other discipline. After the live action filming was completed, most movies are done. We still had a tremendous amount of scenes that we had captured performances on that we had not yet done camera on. These would play back on the stage with Jim and the virtual camera. Hey. Yeah, please. So now, the actors are gone, and he's out there with this virtual camera Got playing back their performances from sometimes months before. Let's do a take. Okay. Over here. Ready? And play back. When he looked through the lens of the virtual camera, it was as if those actors were there giving him the performances live. Yeah, beautiful thing. He would now go and create the actual shots that became the movie. Action! So after all the frenzy and activity of a live action shoot, Lifting. And it's just me with the virtual camera out on a big empty stage for a year. It was a year of this, shooting these cameras. And cut, say that please. Now you've actually got sort of dailies for the first time, actual shots to cut with. Now you edit the scene, get that the way you want. And then that edited cut is what goes to Weta for them to finish. We called that the template. We would see kind of where he put his light, where the compositional elements were, how the art direction was laid out. Basically, Jim handed that over to us as a master guide for what he wanted the shots and the scenes to look like. Weta is only building what we're sending them instead of building out shots and instead of you know, going through these massive amounts of iterations with lighting tests and all these other things. We're giving them something that's much more concise to the point, this is the length of the shot, here's the motion, and here's the camera. And we just followed that, and we would start replacing that with all the high resolution elements. Weta were able to feel the team of some of the best animators in the world. And it sort of broke down into two separate areas. One was the creatures. And the other one was the characters where they were animating from captured performances. Traditionally, when people think of animators, they think of someone who's gonna add life to something that's inanimate. Where Avatar comes in, we're not asking our animators to create the performance. The performance has already been created by the actor. Think fast. Motor control's looking good. <laughs> the animator's job is to analyze performance, analyze every detail of it, and make sure it's coming across. It was very important for us to make sure that whatever Zoe did, whatever Sam did, actually came through their avatars onto the screen and played as convincingly as when they were on the stage. You take a character like Neytiri, and the idea is that the audience <laughs> just has to fall in love with this character. <laughs> when she smiles, there has to be a connection between her smile and the audience. It really is a collaboration. It's working with the actors and then working with the animators to bring the character to the screen. I see you. I see you. We have to figure out how to maintain that integrity, maintain that performance, so that the characters you see on the screen are really what the performance was intended to be. you not not be your we had the actors on set at Weta Digital. We scanned them with our own software, and that's when we were able to take 
60, 70 different fax poses from them, default states, you know, eyes looking left and right, up and down. Any kind of data we could get from the actor just to make sure that the eyes really did feel like Zoe and Sam. The eye motion and the eyes, it's something that's kind of overlooked in a lot of animation films. Our eyes work independently of our bodies and our heads. They also do these little subtle movements. That was another thing we looked for with the reference. It's one of the reasons why the eyes came to life in Avatar. We studied all those details and we made sure they were in there. We made sure Nateri's eyes were locked on Jake when she was arguing with him. What are you saying, Jake? You knew this would happen? Yes. But the real trick to it was figuring out what they call the rig. And the rig is how they program the facial muscles to work. And we all have the same facial muscles, but they're in different proportions and the way in which they fire, meaning how your brain controls your face is different for every person. And this took months and months for each character and it had to be done individually for each character. I will stand and fight. The reference cameras play an integral part in how we evaluate, study the detail within each performance. As good as our facial capture system is, if we really wanted to just see the subtleties on somebody's face, there's nothing better than just seeing a close-up, high-def video of that. They live, Shake. Within Awa. The stress with the animators was to actually animate to the reference camera, and then we'd make sure the performance looks the same, or all the details are in there. Navia. Luyu And then we'd go back to the actual shot camera and see if there's anything lost. Usually, you had gained a lot by doing that. 85% of this is taking from the actors their performances and preserving them in their computer-generated characters. I see you. I see you. But that last 15% requires animators to come in and add things like the tail and the ears. You had to study cat and dog and other animal behavior and incorporate that into how the ears moved, how the tails moved. We studied lions, and we incorporated that into our character. So in a way, the animation is a turbocharger on top of this whole facial capture idea. You should not be here. When Neytiri is furious with Jake, her ears flatten out and her tail's going back and forth. So there's a total character that's created. The animators have taken what the actors are doing and gone even beyond that. And it's a lot of fun to watch. How you feeling, Jake? Hey, guys. It is my performance. This thing walks and talks and acts like me. And it's my interpretation. Even though I'm big, nine foot tall and blue, it's got my personality. It's got my soul. By the numbers. Jake! Jake, listen to me. You're not used to your avatar body. This is dangerous. This is great. Zoe really enjoys watching the footage of her as Neytiri, because Neytiri is this creature that's of her, created by her, but it's apart from her as well. She looked so sexy. <laughs> she was so cut and long and lean. I was like, damn. The first sequence that we turned over to Weta Digital, we turned over in February of 2007. We did not get it back until May of 2008. Those first shots that I finaled, which was the scene where we first see Neytiri and she draws the bow and the witch bright comes out and lands, they were so gorgeous that all of a sudden it was this moment of, holy crap, that looks real. She looks completely real. And then we just sit there and go, hey, look at that. Finaling those first 10 or 11 shots in that scene was absolutely critical. That's the moment where we knew this movie was gonna work. We didn't know yet if we could get all the other 2,600 shots done, but we knew we could make a real character. We were cutting the whole movie together, and in the summer of 2008, a full year and a half before the movie was released, we sat down for the first time to watch a full cut of the then existing movie. And the movie at that time was very, very long. So the film was like a mosaic of, of scenes that were in various stages. So you'd have scenes that were in a pre-cut and then something that was in a virtual camera cut next to something that was turned over six months ago that was in animation level and it was hard to watch. We had to cut the film shorter because it wasn't quite gelling up. It, it, it always felt too long making its points and I kept surgically taking little bits out here and there. And, you know, we eventually wound up cutting out about 40 minutes of film from the time we first screened it for ourselves a year earlier to the time we, we finished the cut. There was a point where 
We had been hoping to just be able to handle the whole film ourselves, but Jim handed us a cut that was about 45 minutes longer than the one that got released, and it still had a lot of character work in it. We said, okay, if we focus only on this character work, that's more work than we thought we were gonna be doing, and it's too late for us to gear up to do the other work. We made the decision to pull work uh, in late 2008, but we didn't get the approval to do it until spring of 2009. So these shots were just lying in wait, the work building up, Jim stressing out about it. Yeah, okay, so you, so you still have some tech work to do on, on contact shadows and reflection. And it was a nail biter. The whole movie was a nail biter in terms of getting things done, because we were always missing these deadlines that we kind of made up out of nowhere. Let's do this by this date. Because we sort of knew if we didn't do that by that date, we wouldn't get this done over here. ILM took the most number of shots and the, and the most complicated shots, and their shots had to seamlessly fit in with Weta's work in the end battle. Other sequences were standalone sequences, where we would get companies like Hydraulics, Frame Store, or Hybrid, and the other visual effects vendors, a complete sequence that they would deliver to us. Because of the way this film was done and, and how long it took to finish shots, we were in a constant state of deadline for, I think, a year and a half to two years. Fire. Three, three two, one, action. Basically, for the last part, we were kind of in a marathon run. We couldn't back off the throttle. And we actually went back and shot a little more live action again later after our last capture. So it sort of went capture, live action, a lot of capture, little tiny bit of live action at the end. actually showed it to a large group of people was Cinema Expo, which is an exhibitor's convention in Amsterdam. We argued about what content to include, and there was a concern that we were including too much of the Fern Gully elements of the film. In particular, the scene where the wood sprites land on Jake. We decided that we wanted to keep it in. And we presented this in Amsterdam to a mixed audience, 3,500 people. The response was remarkable. That was really when it, it proved to us that you could not just sell this movie in 30 second bites. More of this movie was more. We went out and we did Comic-Con, where we showed an abbreviated version of what we showed at Cinema Expo. Are you ready to go to Pandora? <laughs> All right, then let's go. There were some concerns at the studio that the reaction wasn't big enough. I thought it went perfectly. It was a great introduction to an audience. Still, they were dealing more with the 3D and with the CG. They weren't dealing with the film as a narrative. They weren't dealing with it as a story. So we were introducing them to what the film might be. We don't want you to know until December 18th. We want you to still hold back something for the fun of the voyage. And then John Lando and I came up with this idea to do Avatar Day. Avatar Day was where we went out and we took over theaters and we invited audience members to come for free to see 15 minutes of the movie in 3D around the world. It was interesting. The trailer for the film went out the day before and the trailer got a very mixed response. 
There was this sense of, well, what's all the fuss about? This looks like, you know, Smurfs or Thundercats or whatever. And pretty soon, they're ripping us a new one on the internet, 7,500 comments long about how bad this movie is and how it's doomed to fail. I did press for another film on Avatar Day, and all those guys were bagging the movie because they'd just seen the little kind of trailer on the TV. That was a hard thing to stand there and defend, but I'll defend this product all the way. You know, and Jim just said, we we'll just stand by what we do and keep telling the story. But the Avatar Day footage, when people went and saw it in the theater, and didn't see it in a minute and a half or a two minute trailer, but saw 15 minutes of the movie, the response was overwhelming. Ready to rock? Yeah. All right, cool. I remember in the last year before the release of the film, I think I got about five or six days off in a year between doing the sound, doing the music, doing the visual effects, working with all the different teams that were working on the finish. It was unbelievable. And we did video conferencing, so Jim could actually physically point out something. And we would spend hours, if not days, in these review sessions. And oftentimes, we would schedule multiple ones in one day, where we would schedule the crews that were in London in the early morning, because it was already there late night. Tim, how you doing? Hey, you, you want to get time? Yeah. What time is it there? It must be fairly late. We would schedule the crews that were in California at midday, and we would schedule in the afternoon Weta, because it was now just their morning. It's still boiling here, and then we essentially kind of run out of it to what is now 100% Pandoran atmosphere. One of the biggest challenges on this movie was James Horner's. How do you create music for a world that doesn't exist? Jim wanted him and challenged him to combine indigenous sounds into a traditional cinematic score. He came to the set when we were filming the scenes that had the music. He had to create music early on so that we could play it back during certain scenes. The first thing James did on this film was bring in an ethnomusicologist and start collecting sound, vocal sounds and various different instruments from around the world. Initially, the music was a lot more ethnically based. There were lots of people playing stuff. The art department drew about 12 or 15 ethnic percussion instruments that these people would play. And so I was tasked with writing songs for these instruments. And all of that had to be done before things were shot because obviously the actors had to do the motion capture for that stuff. What I did was I sampled a lot of interesting instruments. And then I, I worked with them electronically to get an effect that was different than the instrument could make, but that had a kind of a weird spectral quality that made it sound like you really haven't heard it before, but it doesn't sound quite human either. And there were two women that just are professional singers, and they just pinched off their voice to sound like sort of half African, half Navi children, adult. Tane. Tane. A couple of days went by where we didn't really keep anything that was sung. It was Tane. just getting the right sound. We can get one good one. No, we trust your ears. Yeah. Paul Frommer was the guy who invented the language, and I asked him to write me syllables and consonants that I could use when my people were singing. I was true to the Navi language. It's an amazing score. And because it has all this textual richness from all these ethnic instruments, he would segue between stuff that sounded very tribal into very orchestral sections of the score. But I, I thought the transition between the two was seamless.
And I think it's incredibly powerful. And he, I think he gets to these amazing kind of spiritual moments. He gets to these you know, huge, epic, heroic moments. Which, by the way, there are a number of composers who can do that epic, heroic thing. But to integrate that all organically and always tell the audience exactly what they should be feeling without trying to force them to feel it, it should always accentuate beyond what you're already predisposed to feel. Movies aren't made by one person, they're made by a big group of people. And you know, there's gotta be one you know, idiot that kind of charges out front and says, come on guys, let's go. But then after that, you're putting up on the screen as a result of a team, and in this case, we're gonna put a, a movie out there that's gonna look, look amazing no matter you know, what version you, you, you see it in. But we can know in our hearts that we made a great film. So I think oh. you guys should give up, give up a, a little round of applause for yourselves. Jim said that we would solve our last problem on the last day we delivered the movie. And that held true. Jim looks at every phase of production and says, at a certain point, this is gonna go out of our hands. So what we envisioned doing was basically customizing the release so that every viewer in every theater got the best possible experience. There's a lot of vagaries when it comes to public exhibition. Screens are different sizes. You've got different formats and technologies involving 3D. So we did something that had never been done before. We did a customized release. Wherever you went, it was gonna be the perfect digital cinema package for that theater, and you were gonna get the best possible screening of Avatar that you possibly could. We spent four and a half years on Avatar. We wanted to deliver a perfect experience. Perfect in the photography, perfect in the post-production, perfect in the CG. And we really jumped through a lot of hoops to deliver that experience to the audience. Just to put the glasses on and start that movie and be taken right into space and right to Pandora, it was so visceral, it was so exciting, and it I'd never been taken, literally, it felt, to another world. I wasn't prepared for, first of all, how powerful the emotional story was and how subliminal the effects were. It was seamless, and I just forgot all the work that had gone into it and was just transported. The reaction around the world has just been incredible. It really just kept... take on the military or corporate America. And I thought, well, that's fine. Those comments are there in the film for a reason. So if it provokes a reaction, that's great. That's what it's supposed to do. I think we're living in a day and age now where we realize what we're doing to this planet. It's right in the forefront of a lot of people's minds. You young people are going to have to accept this responsibility. It's your lives. This movie's basically saying, let's just stop for a minute and take a damn look at what we're doing to this world. It seems quite simple. By doing something you can make a change, it just comes down to your choices in life. It seems like the Navi have discovered that, how to live with one with their planet and live with one with all their insecurities. That, to me, is the message of the movie. It's never too late to change. It's never too late to make a better choice. I've been asked to be here to help them raise this voice, raise this cry, and to be a part of this very, very important moment and this very important battle. This movie has sent those messages out in a very profound way, and we all, I think, collectively have been touched by them. Jim has gone to such great lengths to not only trying to say, suspend your disbelief, he's trying to say, be, be here, experience this. 
I love the fact that I'm part of a project that's always going to be remembered or thought of as a very significant moment in the history of film. It feels really, really good to have been a part of something so special and to have worked with people that were so passionate about something that we all just held together and gave it our all. And it's a really good family to belong to. And that's what thrills me, is the fact that throughout history, we're stamped. And nobody can take that away. Like, it did happen. And it did conquer. And it feels great. <laughs> Whatever one thinks of the movie, I know what we accomplished in solving these technical challenges. I know that we were able to take from the actors their beautiful, amazing performances and preserve them in their computer-generated characters. And that was my biggest goal. See the world we come from. There's no green there. They killed their mother. And they're gonna do the same here. The question remains, how much does a piece of entertainment, a movie, actually change the way people act? One can hope that people feel that little twinge of conscience, that little sense of responsibility. It can only be a movement in the right direction. I just don't want to feel that I'm going through this process of making these movies just entertaining people, and it has no higher purpose. I'll settle for a small change. I see you.